Hello everyone, I'm Norman Wahlberger and we're here at the University of New South Wales. In today's lecture we're going to talk about matrices, determinants, and the birth of linear algebra. Linear algebra is a very important topic for 20th century mathematics, almost at a par with calculus as far as undergraduate education goes. But it was not always so. And in the 19th century, linear algebra was just getting going. We're going to talk a little bit about the development uh, both in the 19th century and earlier as well. The origins of the subject really go back uh, to antiquity. They go back to a Chinese work called Nine Chapters of the Mathematical Art. also uh, known as the Chiu Chang Suan Shu, if my pronunciation is about right. And this was written from uh, 300 BC to about 179 AD. It was actually an anonymous work in the sense that we don't actually know who wrote it. There were various contributors. It was composed over several generations. And it basically uh, told us how to solve systems of linear equations and introduce basic ideas of matrices and Gaussian elimination. Okay, so this was a very uh, ancient and important work that really uh, was much earlier than the, the European work in this direction. In the modern time, there was a Japanese mathematician whose name was Seki Koa, who in around 1683 introduced a more modern approach to linear algebra and systems of equations. And simultaneously, more or less, in Europe, Gottfried Leibniz of calculus fame around 1678 considered uh, the general problem. And there's a fundamental problem in the subject which we are uh, going to put here center full. So it's, we have a system of equations of the form xi equals summation k equals 1 to n, say a i k y k, where i goes from 1 to n, and we have therefore uh, n equations in n unknowns. So n equations in n unknowns, y1 through yn. And the idea is that we want to solve for the yi's given the xi's is the basic uh, fundamental problem in linear algebra. So for example, in two dimensions, we have the following situation. For example, a11 y1 plus a12 y2 equals x1 and a21 y1 plus a22 y2 equals x2 system of two equations where we have unknowns y1 and y2 and we have known quantities x1 x2 we want to understand what y1 and y2 are in terms of x1 and x2 and also in terms of these coefficients so these days we like to parcel this system in matrix form so we write things like this by introducing a matrix or an array a11 a12 a21 a22 and then the vector y1, y2 equals x1, x2. And here we're using matrix multiplication, how we multiply a 2 by 2 matrix by a row vector like this. This is a short form for this system here. Now the fundamental fact about this is that this has a unique solution. In other words, we can solve for the y's precisely when a certain number, let's call it delta, 
is non-zero. And that number is A11 times A22 minus A12, A22. So if that number is non-zero, then we can solve for the Y1 and Y2 uniquely. Right? So this is a, uh, a fundamental uh, number, and in modern notation we would say this is precisely when the matrix, uh, so let's call this A, the matrix A is invertible. Now this uh, quantity here, uh, the quantity delta, is the central object here in this uh, topic of determinants. It's an example of a determinant. And it also has the form. We write it sometimes with the matrix like this with square or square brackets. And this is also sometimes written determinant of the matrix A11, A12, a21, A22. So this is an example of a determinant. All right, so this is a basic example, basic problem in linear algebra. Uh, the first sort of non-trivial example of the two by two situation. And this is the crucial quantity that tells us when we actually have a solution. So suppose we do have a solution, then what can we say about the solution? That's the next step to actually solve the system. And that's was all worked out by, well, the, uh, the ancient Chinese and also Kawa and Leibniz. All right, so let's solve this system. So here is the system again. And the solution is that y1, y2 is one over this determinant quantity times the matrix a22, A11 minus A12 minus A21 times X1, X2. So this is a very fundamental and beautiful thing that the linear relationship here can be inverted to get a similar kind of relationship between the y's and the x's, but with this uh, matrix having to be modified, and crucially, this determinant is not equal to uh, zero. Now, around the 1750, Kramer discovered uh, another way of expressing this solution. He realized that we could write it as follows, that y1 is x1, a1, 2, x2, a22, so the two by two determinant formed uh, by that little matrix, divided by the delta, and y2 is similarly the determinant a11, a21, x1, x2, again over the determinant. So what Kramer did is he discovered that there was sort of a closed formula for the solutions individually by taking determinants, actually ratios of determinants, where we take the original coefficient matrix and we remove the first column and replace it with this right-hand column of x's, in the, this case, and over here, replace the second column with the x's and create a determinants. This is called Kramer's rule. And pleasantly, it ends up generalizing to the case of n equations in n unknowns. Now, Kramer was interested in this rule because he had a very specific problem that he wanted to solve, a problem which, in fact, is a very uh, common problem for students of geometry. And the problem is, so he was motivated by the problem of how to find a conic through five points. So it's a basic fact of geometry that if you have five points in the plane, then there is a unique conic that passes through them. Maybe in this case something like an ellipse. 
So the conic is, in general, of the equation ax squared plus, say, bxy plus cy squared plus dx plus ey plus f equals 0. So there are six coefficients that we have to find. But in fact, there's really only five coefficients because up to a scaling, the conic doesn't change. If we multiply all the coefficients by a number, it doesn't change. So there's really only five degrees of freedom. And if we have five points, well, we can substitute each one of those five points in there and we'll get five equations in essentially five unknowns. So this is a very uh, familiar problem that in fact uh, has been solved over and over again by many generations of geometry students. But it's uh, useful to point out that there is a little bit of a more pleasant way of solving this particular problem, which is quite interesting. So it turns out that if we look at four of the points, those four points determine a pencil of conics. So four of the five points determine a pencil of conics. So in other words, a one parameter family of conics. So perhaps this one, perhaps a, a elongated one, or maybe a hyperbola and so on. So this one parameter family of conics. And amongst those are two, or actually three special ones, which include products of lines. So for example, if we take this line together with this line, the product of the two equations of those two lines is a second degree equation, so it's actually also a conic. And if we call that product of lines C1, and then choose another pair of lines, say this one and this one, and call this product C2, then any combination of these equations C1 and C2 will be another conic which also passes through the same four points. So if we take lambda C1 plus C2, this is another conic in the pencil for any scalar lambda. So we just down, write down the equation of uh, the lines multiplied together, the equations of the other two lines multiplied together, then set that equal to zero, then that's going to be a, a, an equation which is still satisfied by the four points, because the four points, if you plug in here and here, both give you zero, so they'll give you zero when you plug into this linear combination. So this is a general conic in this pencil, and so now in order to find the conic that passes through the fifth point, all we have to do is, in fact, solve one equation. We have to only find this lambda here. So if we, uh, if we sub in the fifth point, we get a linear equation for lambda. So in fact, this canonical uh, geometry problem can be solved in a more efficient way rather than writing down five equations in five unknowns. But um, you can certainly do it also that way. That's a historical problem that motivated uh, the important rule given by Kramer. So now a natural question is, okay, how are we going to generalize this? This is all fine and good for the 2x2 two two case. Then the 17th, 18th century mathematicians, of course, were interested in larger systems of equations. And for that, we need to generalize this notion of the determinant. So here is the 3x3 three three determinant. If we have a matrix A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, then the determinant is defined to be the sum of these six terms with plus and minus signs. So this is a sum of products, uh, one from each row and column of the matrix. So for example, the first product is A times E times I. We're taking those three entries one from each row and each column. And the others are all of the same kind, A, F, H, B, F, G, B, D, I, C, D, H, and C, E, G. 
These correspond to the six possible ways of putting three rooks on a three by three chessboard in such a way that none of the rooks can take each other. In general, if there's an n by n chessboard, there are n factorial such ways of arranging these n rooks. And each of those n factorial positions will correspond to an entry in this sum. But there's another important ingredient in this definition, and that's the plus and minus signs. Okay. So this relies on an important combinatorial result. which goes back to the great French mathematician Cauchy, who was one of the main architects of the theory of determinants. And the result is what's called the parity theorem. The parity theorem is that uh, the number of transpositions required to say write or an express a permutation is always odd or always even. So let me illustrate that in the four by four case. So suppose we have a permutation of four things that we're going to obtain by swapping entries. So suppose we swap the one and the three at the first step. So we've swapped the one and the three. And then maybe at the next step, we'll swap the three and the four. And maybe at the next step, we'll swap the one and the three. So to go from the original to the final, we made these three swaps. It's an odd number of swaps or transpositions. And the parity theorem is that if you want to go from this permutation to this permutation. You can do it in a lot of different ways. You can use a lot more transpositions if you want, but you will always require an odd number of transpositions, never an even one. So if one way of doing it is even, then all the other ways of doing it are even. If one way of doing it is odd, then all the other ways of doing it are odd. This is a very important combinatorial result, which often perhaps doesn't get the mention that it deserves when the theory of determinants is established very important ingredient. So how does this figure in uh, the, the definition? So it turns out that the coefficient of a term is minus one to this parity, to this number of transpositions required to, uh, to get the, the number of transpositions to get uh, the given permutation from the original permutation 1 to up to n. So for example, if we start with a, e, and i, and we want to get a, f, and h, we can think about getting that by swapping the two columns. So if we swap the two columns, then these positions go to those positions. If we think about rooks on a chessboard. But if we want to get BFG, then we have to do two swaps. Yeah, so if we swap these two columns, then we would have us rooks in here and here. And then if we swap these two uh, columns, we would end up with rooks here and here. So that would be two swaps of columns required to go from the original to this one. And that's why there's a plus sign there. Okay, so that's uh, the sort of the general pattern. Uh, once you've seen this formula and given this description, you can then generalize the story to the uh, four by four and higher dimensional cases. Now, there was a, sort of an alternate way of thinking about things, which was discovered by Vandermont. And this was also in the 1700s, who realized that the above determinant could be written also as A times EI minus FH. So this entry times that two by two determinant formed by that little submatrix. And then minus B times the determinant that you get by eliminating the row and column through that B. So the determinant of DFGH 
which is di minus fg. And then plus c times the 2 by 2 determinant there, plus c times dh minus eg. So in this way, a 3 by 3 determinant could be reduced to calculating three 2 by 2 determinants and then taking some appropriate combination of them with weightings which are also the other entries which haven't been used yet. And so there's a, an inductive way of doing this. If you have a 4 by 4 uh, determinant, van der Maan realized you could write that as a sum of essentially four 3 by 3 determinants multiplied by the corresponding uh, sort of uh, other entries. So this is a very important uh, way of actually physically calculating determinants. It's the way uh, computers will uh, often do it is to, to sort of reduce things sort of into a um, sort of recursive uh, fashion by re calculating a bigger one in terms of smaller ones. But it turns out that there's also another kind of algorithm in this uh, direction which was uh, introduced by another great mathematician, Laplace, which uh, these days is not uh, so widely known. I'd like to show you that as well. So this uh, general strategy of taking a complicated problem and then reducing it to a bunch of similar but smaller uh, problems, sometimes called uh, dynamic programming. So here's another example of that kind of thing. This is uh, due to Laplace, another very important 18th century mathematician to realize that you could expand, say, a 4x4 four four determinant in terms of a bunch of products of 2x2 two two determinants. So what Laplace does here is he, first of all, ch chooses two rows, say the top two, and then creates all the possible 2x2 two two determinants that you can from those two rows. So from those two rows, for example, we could create uh, this 2x2 two two determinant giving us A, B, E, F, and then the remaining rows and columns give us this sort of opposite two by two matrix, which also has a determinant. So we can multiply this determinant by that one. And then we can look at other two by two determinants formed in, by the top two rows. For example, the A, C, E, G determinant and then we would have to multiply that by the corresponding block down here of, again, the rows and columns that we haven't used uh, there. So we would uh, multiply this determinant by this determinant, but this time with a minus sign, because basically we've transposed two of the columns. Every time we interchange two things, we should introduce a minus sign. So there are then six possible such uh, products corresponding to basically the six ways of choosing a two by two block from those first two rows. And this generalizes in a nice way to more general matrices. So you can decompose a five by five determinant into a lot of products of two by two and three by three uh, determinants. So this kind of manipulation was uh, very popular in the 18th, especially 19th centuries. And so it culminated in this very important work by Thomas Moore called A Treatise on the Theory of Determinants, written around uh, the late 1800s. This edition is in the early 1900s and has hundreds and hundreds of pages of fabulous formulas involving determinants. 19th century mathematicians really developed a very deep theory about what was going on with these determinants. This is a very interesting precursor to linear algebra. These days we study linear algebra and determinants as only a small chapter. But in the 19th century point of view, linear algebra basically you know, almost was the theory of determinants. There wasn't really a lot else that wasn't subsumed in one way or another by the theory of determinants. That's a good book to, uh, to peruse if you're interested in this subject. Okay, so then uh, we come to the main architect of the modern theory of determinants, who was August Louis Cauchy, great French mathematician, 1789 to 1857, second only to Euler, really, in terms of his mathematical output, and made contributions uh, to pretty well all uh, subjects. In the theory of determinants, he was a key architect. He introduced uh, systematic notation,
In other words, for example, the double subscript notation, like A equals A, I, J, to stand for a matrix whose entries are A sub I sub J. He actually introduced the term determinant. And he was responsible for discovering the fundamental fact about determinants. It's one fact which is more important than any other, and that is the rule that the determinant of a product of two matrices is the determinant of the first matrix times the determinant of the second. All right, so this involves matrix multiplication, two matrices, and the determinant of a product is the product of the determinants, key fact. Another important contributor was J.J. Sylvester who was a British mathematician, lived from 1814 to uh, 1897, but uh, made important contributions also to American uh, mathematics. He was, ended up um, teaching at Johns Hopkins University and founded the American Journal of Mathematics. But although he had an earlier stint at the University of Virginia, which he left after uh, clobbering a, a student who insulted him in class with a stick, the student was so shocked that he sort of fainted and uh, Sylvester thought he had killed him and uh, so subsequently sort of left Virginia, not, not having been there very long. So Sylvester uh, made lots of contributions to the theory. He introduced the term matrix, for example. But I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about his work on resultants. He, so he redefined the uh, theory of resultants. All right, so the theory of resultants is an interesting uh, chapter in linear algebra, with the theory of equations, which unfortunately is not taught to undergraduates often these days. So uh, what's the basic idea? The idea is that we want to eliminate variables from a system of equations, but not necessarily a linear system. We're interested in polynomial systems. So for example, uh, here's a fundamental problem in the subject. We have two, say, n degree polynomials, f of x equals a n x to the n plus a n minus one x to the n minus one plus and so on down to a zero. And we're sitting at equal to zero. That's one equation, polynomial equation in x. And we have a similar uh, second polynomial equation. And let's make it of the same degree for simplicity, b n x to the n plus b n minus 1 x to the n minus 1 plus all the way down to b 0 equals 0. So there's a natural question here which is how can we tell if these two equations have a common 0? If there's a common solution to both of them? Well one way of course is to solve both of the equations and see if two of the zeros actually coincide. But for an nth degree equation that can be highly problematic. And so people wanted to know, is there some faster way of figuring out whether there's a common zero without actually having to go through the trouble of actually solving these things, which in fact we might not be able to do. So the question is how to see if there was a common zero or solution. All right, so this kind of question had been uh, examined by a lot of people. So Newton was interested in this kind of thing. Euler uh, discussed it. And uh, there was sort of a classical theory uh, given by Bazou, who wrote uh, around 1764 to 69, wrote a book called Cours de Mathematique, of course in mathematics, where amongst other things he outlined the theory of how to figure these things out. And the key so sort of object is, uh, well, something called a resultant. So let me illustrate uh, how that works for this, uh, this situation, and then we'll see how Sylvester came along and basically sort of uh, redefined uh, this theory and introduced another aspect to it. Okay, so our problem is to try to sort of eliminate between these two equations to see whether there is a common solution. So let's call this first equation one and the second one equation two. So here's the strategy that was discovered. 
The strategy is to first of all do sort of an obvious thing, which is to multiply equation one by the coefficient bn and equation two by a sub n and then subtract. Okay, clearly if we multiply this by uh, b sub n and this one by a sub n, we subtract, then the x to the n terms will disappear and we'll have an equation of degree n minus 1. That's the crucial thing. And then the next step is to do something similar but a little bit more clever, is to multiply equation 1 by b n x plus b n minus 1. And equation 2 by a n x plus a n minus 1 and subtract. All right, I'll leave it to you to think about what happens there. But what happens is that, uh, again, the, uh, the higher degree terms cancel and we end up with an equation of degree n minus 1. And then at the next step, we multiply 1 by bnx squared plus bn minus 1x plus bn minus 2. And equation 2 by the corresponding anx squared plus an minus 1x plus an minus 2. And subtract. And we get another equation of degree n minus 1. So we get ultimately n equations of degree n minus 1 in, and now we view those equations as equations in the variables 1x up to x to the n minus 1. So on the right hand side of the equations where we always have 0 because we're just taking linear combinations of these things, and so when we look at these n minus 1 equations in these n variables, there is a non-zero solution. Namely, we're assuming that there's a common solution. And if there's a common solution to this system, then the corresponding determinant of coefficients must be zero. So since we have a solution by assumption, the determinant uh, of the, the coefficients must equal zero. And this is then a polynomial relation, this determinant of the coefficients that you get with these n minus one equations uh, is then a polynomial relation. This is a polynomial relation on the original coefficients uh, a0 up to a n and b0 up to bn. And that relation is called uh, resultant. So let's have a look at a specific example. So for example, suppose that our first equation is quadratic. a1x squared, and let me write the coefficients this way. b1x plus c1 equals 0. And the second equation is a2x squared plus b2x plus c2 equals 0. All right, what we're we supposed to do, we're supposed to take equation uh, 1 and multiply it by a2 and subtract uh, a1 times equation 2. And that gives us a2b1 minus a1b2x plus a2c1 minus a1c2 equals 0. And then the other uh, next step, a2x plus b2 times equation 1 minus a1x plus b1 times equation 2 will give us then uh, a2c1 minus a1c2x plus b2c1 minus b1c2 equals 0. 
So in this case, we get two equations in the variables one and x. And in order for this to have a solution, which we're assuming, the determinant here must be zero. So the condition is, the condition for a solution, for a common solution is that the determinant, which is this times this minus this times this equals zero. We can write that as a1, b1, a2, b2 times b1, c1, b2, c2. That determinant equals the determinant a1, c1, a2, c2, all squared. So this is a beautiful relation that is necessary for these two general quadratic equations to have a common solution. If this equation is satisfied, then there's a common solution. In fact, we can say a little bit more. Uh, once you know this condition, you can actually just solve for the x. So the x is uh, then say minus a1 c1 a2 c2, that determinant divided by a1 b1 a2 b2. So this polynomial relation was called a resultant by the 18th century mathematicians and they generalized that to not just uh, two by two situations but to higher and even when the two polynomials are not of the same degree. And then Sylvester came along and discovered a remarkable alternate way, perhaps a more efficient way, of writing down what this resultant is. So the formula that Sylvester discovered was involving a big determinant. So in general, if the equations are of degrees, say, m and n, then we need a m plus n squared determinant. So let me illustrate it in the case of our, our system that we had before. So in the case of the 2 uh, plus 2, we need a 4 by 4 uh, matrix. So the first equation had coefficients a1, b1, and c1, and so we write down those coefficients just in a row like that. And then in the next row, we take those same coefficients and just move them over by 1. Now at that stage, we've bumped into the right-hand side and we can't move it further, so we stop with that first equation and go to the second equation, which was a2, b2, c2. I write it down and do the same kind of stepwise translation to the right one each time. And if necessary, we have to go quite a few steps each time, just moving it down to the right by one until it bumps into the, the wall. So we end up with this four by four matrix formed by the coefficients of the two equations. And the relation is that the determinant of this should be equal to zero. That's a polynomial relation satisfied by the coefficients of the two polynomials that ensures that they have a common zero. So can we see our earlier formula from here? Well, we can actually, if we look at it from the point of view of Laplace. If we think about expanding this thing using these two rows, say, then we could use that two by two block and multiply it by the corresponding determinant of that two by two block. And then we'd have to uh, go to another two by two block contained in these top two rows, say, say A1, C1, A2, C2. So we could do, say, uh, uh, this one. Oh, not that one, sorry. This one, this one, and this one. And then uh, the corresponding opposite one would be, uh, say, this one, this one, this one, and this one. 
with a minus sign. And uh, if you a little bit of thought shows that there are no other two by two uh, determinants formed by these two rows because of that column of zeros at the end. So Laplace's equation would give us immediately the product of that uh, first determinant times, uh, times A1, B1, A2, B2 determinants and minus this A1, C1, A2, C2 determinant squared equals zero. So a very lovely uh, formula, very useful formula of, uh, of Sylvester because this problem actually comes up quite a lot in computational algebraic uh, geometry and other applications. Okay, so the story of determinants, of course, extends uh, beyond that. So there were a lot of other things uh, involved. There were uh, determinants being used as volumes. So basically, if you want to compute the volume of a parallelepiped in three-dimensional space, uh, then you basically take a determinant of the matrix you form by the three vectors. There was also the Cayley-Hamilton uh, theorem, which Hamilton theorem, which gave an algebraic relation identified or supported by a general matrix. And then we get to the theory of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. But generally, what happened in the 20th century is there was a shift from the 19th century orientation to quite a different orientation. In the late 19th century, uh, vectors uh, started emerging as an important way of thinking about engineering and physical problems. Originally motivated from Hamilton's Quaternions theory, but then ended up having a sort of life of its own.